From the banks of a murky river, to the placid waters of a shallow pond, and down the winding course of a canal, each waterway has been the silent witness to an unusual disappearance. Let's begin in the UK with the disappearance of Suvik Paul, who was 19 years old, when he vanished while out on a New Year's Eve night in 2012 with a group of his friends in Manchester. Suvik was a bright young man studying product design at the Manchester University. According to his friends and roommates, he was easy to get along with and always up for a laugh, which made him quite popular at the university. Going on that night out was actually a brand new experience for Suvik. One of his new friends from the uni, Charlotte, said that she was worried about him attending as he'd arrived from India and had never been on a night out like this before. Her worries were probably justified too because the venue they were attending is quite intimidating in some regards. It's very large and gets busy. As I'm sure many have experienced here, at some point during the night in such places, it can become quite easy to either get separated or to lose track of others. Regardless though, Suvik was said to be enthusiastic about that night and was very much looking forward to it. Unfortunately though, he would make some highly questionable decisions that night. The venue in question was called the Warehouse Project, located here. In the hours leading up to the disappearance, Suvik and his friends had been drinking and apparently, Suvik had taken another substance also. According to his friends, he had researched how to hide these capsules from the club sniffer dogs and get them inside by hiding them in his clothing. This, as it turns out, was not a good idea given what ended up happening that night. Because of the busy nature of this club, the staff created a one-way system to help people navigate the place without getting in each other's way. I'm sure that you can imagine the kind of problems that can arise when everyone's drinking at the very least and bumping into one another. In any case, at some point during the night, Suvik became separated from his friends and I believe he became quite belligerent as he charged at a member of the security staff in order to get past the one-way system. I believe he was also trying to jump the queue to the toilet which would result in Suvik being thrown out at 10.55pm that night. He would be seen five minutes later at 11pm on CCTV outside the building. Then again, a short time later on another camera. Suvik was trying to climb over a fence to get back to the club and two of the men were heading down an embankment to the canal. This would be the very last time Suvik would ever be seen again. He did try to text his friends to tell them what had happened, but because the phone lines were so busy, they only got through the following day. He was also reported missing on the first day of 2013 by his roommate who had attempted to make contact with Suvik, but each attempt went unanswered. A major search was initiated by the authorities to locate him, but these efforts led nowhere. All of the CCTV footage was analysed and it was determined that Suvik climbing the fence was the very last time he was captured. Interestingly, search dogs could not find a scent. Ok, let's get bizarre now. This search went on for around 3 weeks and on the 22nd day, Suvik's body was found in an area that was searched repeatedly in the Bridgewater Canal, just 50 feet away from the nightclub and his original point of disappearance. How the body had been missed so many times despite being so close is not clear. Even the coroner's report was strange. Pathologist Naomi Carter concluded that the cause of passing was drowning and that there were not marks to Suvik's clothing and no physical injuries. Recording an open verdict, coroner Joanne Kersley said that although the substances were likely to have contributed to his behaviour, they were not the cause of his passing. She said, despite extensive investigation, it cannot be ascertained where or how he entered the water. If you've watched my previous video, this is all sounding somewhat reminiscent of David Plunkett's disappearance, isn't it? If you haven't seen it, I'll leave a link to it in the description and in the top right corner of this video now if you wish to open a new tab. 
it's not sequential. You can watch these videos in either order. Now, as explained, Suvik had sustained no injuries whatsoever, and an open verdict was recorded. We can glean a couple of things from this. For those that don't know, an open verdict is the coroner's way of saying that the occurrence is perhaps suspicious, and there is insufficient evidence to definitively determine the cause. It's essentially an acknowledgement that the passing has not been explained or is uncertain after all of the available evidence has been taken into account and considered. The recording of an open verdict is very strange in this case, because you'll note that the pathologist on the other hand stated that it was a clear-cut case of drowning. Either there was water in the lungs, or there was not. That seems like a very odd back and forth there. If this was a clear-cut case of drowning, you think that would have been confirmed by the coroner? From an initial glance, it seems like two conflicting pieces of information. However, I did a bit of reading around the idea of a pathologist and coroner perhaps concluding differently, and here's a relevant quote that I came across. Sometimes, even if the physical evidence points towards a specific cause of passing, there might be too many unanswered questions about the circumstances leading up to that cause. For example, if someone were determined to have drowned, but it's unclear how they ended up in the water, the coroner might opt for an open verdict. That wasn't specifically in regards to this case, but that at least makes some sense. So in essence, the coroner could also have determined that he did drown, but because there's so many unanswered questions otherwise, specifically in terms of the fact that the authorities had absolutely no idea how or where he'd ended up in the water, the coroner opted for an open verdict. So it's not necessarily a disagreement between the pathologist and coroner, though it's still out of the ordinary. The amount of time the body had been in the water had also not been specified. This is important also, because based on where he was found, it's not even clear to me that he'd been in the water for the entire 22 day duration. It's odd that you'd be found 50 feet away from the point at which he'd vanished, despite that very area being under a constant search. Because of the uncertainties and unusualness of this case, Suvik's father said that he believed that there must have been the involvement of a third party. I must admit, I find myself in agreement with him. There's something abnormal about this entire situation, which former detective Chief Superintendent Tony Blockley also noted. Tony made an astute observation. He detailed that the six foot fence in question that Suvik apparently tried to climb over means that for some unknown reason, Suvik had crossed a bridge over a canal, then traveled down the far side to try to climb over the fence that was on the opposite side of the canal to the nightclub. This was highly unusual and doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The argument cannot be that Suvik had planned to climb over the fence, jump into the water, and then swim back down to the club where he'd have been soaking wet. Unless, of course, he was completely out of his mind at that point. But given that the authorities had absolutely no idea where he entered the water to have been found where he was, it perhaps seems unlikely that he entered the water there. We're in speculation territory now, but could Suvik have been attempting to escape from a perceived threat? That at least makes more sense than climbing over a fence randomly on the other side of the water to the club. That literally does not even make sense to suggest that that was an attempt to get back into the club. It just seems that somehow, there's more to this incident than meets the eye. This incident, alongside David Plunkett's and others from this area, have led to speculations that a certain unknown third party has been the cause of this and is pushing people in. In 2001, manchestersfinest.com reported, Since 2007, authorities have pulled 77 bodies out of Manchester's canal and waterway network, many of which are young men. Are these a series of unrelated accidents, or is there something more to this? Professor Craig Jackson said that it was unlikely that such a high number of cases are the result of just accidents. Law enforcement in turn stated that there is no evidence to support this and that if someone was actively pushing people into the canal, the pusher could not be certain that this would even cause someone to pass away. Detective Chief Superintendent Russ Jackson of Greater Manchester has said that there is no evidence that an individual is stalking the city's canals. 
What is very important to bear in mind in all these cases is that they have been subject to separate investigations and there is no evidence at all to suggest that they are linked or were suspicious. While in some cases it remains uncertain how people came to be in the water, just like Suvik. Something to note is that none of the missing had ever been caught on CCTV being pushed into the water and the UK is one of the most surveilled countries in the world. So if there is someone pushing people in, it means that he, or they if a group, have to be extremely knowledgeable of where all the cameras are. If that is the case, that sounds like a very well put together and detailed operation. Also arguably making that less likely. The inquest heard that there was not an explanation as to how and where he entered the water. Over 10 years have passed since this incident and the circumstances are unlikely to ever be explained now. We'll come back to the UK, but first let's visit the United States of America. Jelani Brinson was 24 years old at the time of his disappearance when he vanished from Anoka in the state of Minnesota. Jelani seemed to have been quite a successful man as he'd started a family and had an unborn son. At the time, he'd also recently been promoted at his job too. I'm not sure if he was celebrating specifically on the day that he went missing, but he certainly had a lot to look forward to. Sometime on the evening of the 17th of April 2009, Jelani would make a phone call to his mother who was at the Mad Jack Sports Cafe at Brooklyn Park. But this call went unanswered as she never heard it over the crowded restaurant. Jelani would disappear not too long after this call was made. That evening, he was with his friends who out of sheer coincidence later recalled that they alongside Jelani were also in Mad Jack's that night and he actually probably made that call to his mother from inside the restaurant while they were both present. The pair sadly never bumped into one another. Once Jelani and his friends were done at Mad Jack's, they left to visit the home of a fellow co-worker of his who lived on Kennedy Street and they arrived at about 10pm. Most sources indicate that five minutes after arriving, Jelani stepped outside to smoke and minutes later, the others came out to do the same. Things take a bizarre turn now because as the others came outside, his friend stated that he began to display unusual behavior in the sense that, and I quote, Jelani put his head down and left. The reasons as to why he did that were not clear to anyone. They weren't sure why this had just happened or what went on that caused him to leave. It seems that they didn't know if he was just messing around or what, but they went out into the neighborhood to look for him, but they couldn't find him. 55 minutes later at 11 PM, a call was made from Jelani's phone, but to whom was never made available to the public. Things immediately get a little bit suspect here to me because after he ran away, the friends didn't report this to the emergency services or anything. It seems as though they had a little look around for him, couldn't find him and assumed that he would just be okay and would get home fine. I'm not actually sure what was going through their minds at that point. Perhaps whatever it was they were smoking wasn't something they wished others, especially law enforcement to know about and so didn't want to call it in, but that is total speculation on my part. I'm not sure why else you wouldn't report it in, though I suppose it must have been somewhat confusing if he literally just bolted out of nowhere for reasons you couldn't ascertain. The following day, he didn't show up to work and was absent from a visit he was supposed to make. And I believe one of these incidents was the spark that made its way to his mother, which is when she realized that something was wrong. Alice, Jelani's mother, an emergency room nurse, called police late Saturday afternoon after her son missed work and failed to visit his daughter. He also had not picked up his car. She told the media, I keep calling his phone to see if someone might answer, but it just goes into voicemail. I don't know what to think, but I don't think it's good. Over 50 search and rescue personnel with search dogs arrived on Kennedy Street on the 19th and began looking. Not long after the search began, searchers found one of his shoes and his hat in a neighbor's garden right next to some railroad tracks. I believe that this property was right across the street from the friend's house. Soon after, they found his other shoe south of the tracks in an industrial area. 
This, for some reason, led authorities to speculate about the possibility that he might have somehow managed to get onto a slow moving train for some reason. It's not really clear why they went straight to that. It seems very random and arbitrary to me, but Jelani's girlfriend said that would have been completely out of character for him to have just absconded and left like that without saying anything. Perhaps there was a realisation behind the scenes just how odd it was that they'd found the shoes and no other clues at all. And so, they were just trying to jump to the first thing that could technically make sense. In any case, it seems that at some point they came to their senses and abandoned that line of thought. Without some kind of external factor or influence, I can't think of a single reason aside from some kind of medical incident as to why he would just leave abruptly and then abandon his shoes. Let's be clear, he was outside for 5 minutes so this had nothing to do with hypothermia. Again, this is speculation, but if the group had taken a substance that they shouldn't have, there is the potential that Jelani could have had a bad reaction to it. Also, just to clarify that we are actually in speculation land, police said that Jelani had a clean record and that there was no immediate sign that any substances or drinking were a factor in the disappearance. So, from law enforcement's perspective, I can only imagine they questioned the friends and had their investigation into that night, but came to the conclusion that those things weren't a factor at all. Given that, I'd love to hear some opinions as to what else could have caused him to ditch his shoes. One way or another, it sounds like once you ditch them, generally speaking, you're not going to be getting very far, so where did he go? Search dogs tracked Jelani's scent from near his friend's home in Anoka to an area about one and a half miles west. The scent trail ended about 100 yards behind the outpost bar. His family viewed the bar's security tapes but didn't see him, police chief Phil Johansson said. This is quite unusual, because we know based off the items found. In theory, we know where he'd been, so the dog should have gone from point A to point B to C etc until we got to him. This of course did not happen, and the dogs went straight west as said behind the outpost bar. It's interesting that he wasn't spotted on CCTV, and presumably, if he was even there, he'd gone all that way barefoot, was he alone? There's a huge, obvious question mark in regards to that time period where absolutely nothing is really known. Speaking of which, let's get bizarre, because while things already didn't make any sense, they're about to make even less. The search had been ongoing for a week and found absolutely nothing other than the shoes and hat. Now, on that 7th day, the 25th of April 2009, at 1 in the afternoon, an employee at the Greenhaven Golf Course noticed something unusual floating in a 3 foot deep pond. The employee had discovered Jelani floating face up, and weirdly, this was only 1500 feet away from the friend's house. The location is about 1500 feet from where Jelani was last seen, across the street and over some railroad tracks from the home on Kennedy Street. Jelani's body did not have shoes on, yet the socks were clean. Investigators say this means he didn't walk into the pond on his own, he was placed there. When law enforcement came to investigate the pond, initially it was felt that this whole thing was just an unfortunate accident. But soon, certain details were realised that made things very unclear. It was found that Jelani had only passed away a few days prior at most, but he'd been missing for the entire week. It was this fact, coupled with the fact that he had clean socks, that made the authorities believe that his body was somehow placed in the pond, but they had no idea how that came to be. There were no obvious footprints indicating he'd walked to the pond, or had been dragged or carried by someone else, and there were no tyre marks or anything of that nature, so it's not as if someone had driven up close to the pond. Also, the search dogs never tracked his scent to this body of water. How does one just get into a pond like this without leaving behind any kind of trace as to what happened? The Anoka County Medical Examiner's Office conducted an autopsy and reported that the cause of passing was inconclusive. No marks or signs of injury or foul play were found during the examination, and there were no substances in his system. Anatomical causes such as a heart attack or a brain aneurysm and even drowning was ruled out. The autopsy revealed that Jelani passed away before he entered the water. There was no water in his lungs, so what even happened here? 
Initially, you'd be forgiven if you thought that something like perhaps a disoriented Jelani wandered away and some kind of robbery or altercation or something along those lines occurred and went awry. But that almost certainly wasn't the case as his wallet with money was found on the body and he'd sustained no injuries. The sheriff's lieutenant, Paul Sommer, expanded on this point and said that there were no signs of an altercation at either of the locations where the shoes and hat were found. He also said that the friends he was with that night had cooperated completely. The authorities almost certainly, privately at the very least, had to suspect that the friends had done something. But it also appears that there was no evidence whatsoever to suggest any wrongdoing by them. If there were no signs of a struggle, does this mean that he just took them off voluntarily then? Because there were no signs of some kind of medical event or third party interruption, there's just something so weird and wrong about this case to me. None of this is really making any sense at all. Paul Sommer stated this. The coroner couldn't say why he passed away. That's what makes this investigation so difficult. It is particularly frustrating because normally in a situation like this, we expect certain things to be apparent. If he's found in a pond, you'd think he drowned. He did not. Or, if he was dumped there, you'd think you'd find an anatomical cause or substances. That was not there, either. We have very little to go on. The Sheriff's Department stated that this was one of the most frustrating cases they'd ever been involved with, and said that the medical examiner's report just made it all the more confusing. Because of a very baffling lack of evidence to point towards anything, Detective Maggie Titus was brought in and stated this. It's my job to make sure that I can get her an answer. I'm trying to give it a fresh set of eyes. In this 1500 foot area, what happened to Jelani? Was he being chased? Was he scared of something? His passing, to me, is very suspicious. As far as I know, he did not drown. We don't even really know what happened, but we know he didn't end up in that pond by himself. The toxicology report found high levels of GHB in his system. This is a substance that can be placed into a person's drink. That's not to say that's how he ingested it, but for one reason or another, there was a higher than normal presence of it in his body. Ingesting GHB can result in short-term confusion and disorientation. A high dose can lead to unconsciousness. If nothing else had actually gone down at the friend's house, could that have been an indicator that he was confused and disoriented? He was at Mad Jack's that night, could he have ingested it there? We also know that he passed away two days at most before he was found. So he was either alive or was being kept alive for five days prior. So there's also the possibility that during that time is when the GHB entered his system. The comments relayed by the public generally lean towards the idea that Jelani had run into foul play. But how do you come to terms with the fact that there was just no evidence of this at all? He hadn't been harmed and the coroner couldn't even determine how he passed away. I'm of the view that something very unusual happened to Jelani. I don't know exactly what I'm proposing other than to say some kind of event took place that was completely out of his control. I don't know what it looked like or what it consisted of but the facts as laid out do not gel well together at all. The fact that there was no water in the lungs is very strange especially when coupled with the fact that he hadn't sustained injury either. I came across a lot of comments by the public that seemed to capture the way people felt and thought about this. I've paraphrased a couple of them to get to the gist of what they were saying as they were quite long. Doesn't look like foul play was involved. So Jelani left the house, took off his shoes and hat by the railroad tracks, walked a mile and a half in one direction and then walked back a mile and a half to go straight into the shallow golf course pond where he did not drown, unlikely. There is something not right with this. Why in the world would a seemingly healthy, sane, athletic young 24 year old go missing like this? We know that he didn't hop onto a slow moving train which was a silly suggestion in the first place. How can the suggestion be that he threw his shoes around, walked barefoot all that way to the bar only to change his mind and go for a swim in the pond? Honestly, I believe that foul play took place that night. I think he tried to run up the tracks but was caught before he reached the bar which is why the scent went no further. Also, these friends of his, why didn't they call the authorities when they couldn't find him? It's very suspicious. 
Over 14 years have passed since this incident took place, and nothing has ever been uncovered. Now, let's explore the final disappearance, which is shorter. On the 6th of December 2015, 20-year-old Jason Norfolk vanished during a night around the town with his girlfriend alongside some of their friends. In the early hours of the morning, Jason left the bar known as Rumours alone and vanished that night. His girlfriend stated that Jason just up and leaving by himself was unusual behaviour for him because typically their friend group would let everyone know that they were leaving before doing so. This particular bar was busy at the time and no one had noticed that he left until some time after when he couldn't be found inside the venue. According to the authorities, this picture, which isn't at all helpful, was captured by CCTV and shows the last people to see Jason before he disappeared. After he left the bar, Jason made his way towards the city centre where four men briefly spoke to him and helped him out of a taxi someone else had ordered. It's thought that Jason may have had a minor altercation with these men before continuing on towards the town centre to find another taxi to get home. This behaviour was also said to be out of character for Jason, so it could point to the idea that he'd had too much to drink and was perhaps somewhat disoriented and confused. Jason was last seen on CCTV walking towards High Street in the city centre at 1.26am and his precise movements thereafter were untraceable. Jason never made it home that night and at 3.37pm, 14 hours later, he was reported missing after failing to arrive home and no one being able to contact him through his phone. This is where things take a strange turn. During Jason's walk, he passed by the North Bridge, which allows travel over a small river, which it's believed he crossed. A large search effort up the river was undertaken by the authorities and many volunteers, which uncovered Jason's shoes in the mud besides the river. A few metres away from the shoons, his phone laid in the mud. Slightly further beyond, his trousers were found with his wallet still in the back pocket. Jason's body was never found. No explanation for the shoes and trousers being strewn around in the mud was ever really given, with the authorities simply stating that no foul play was suspected and that Jason must have just fallen into the river where he came to pass away. It's not clear what the family's opinion was, but Jason's mother did state this. Jason was a fit lad. He might have been able to climb out of the water. You have to wonder why his body hasn't been found. You wonder if the fact that he was only small and slim is the reason why he hasn't been found. All kinds of things run through your mind. It's clear to see why the authorities may have ruled out foul play. Because his wallet was still inside the trousers and was untampered with, that doesn't suggest a mugging. Based on comments surrounding this disappearance, a lot of people seem to get hung up on the fact that his shoes and trousers had been removed. And this is a good point, what exactly happened there? Could they have come off during the fall or a struggle in the water? Commenters also seem surprised that his body was said to have been washed away but none of the other items had been. Based on the wording, it's not clear that the other items had been in the river itself, because it was stated that they were found in the mud besides the river. Though, given that the authorities stated that they believed he'd fallen in, I suppose they must have, otherwise that wouldn't make sense. Because then you have to argue that he removed them voluntarily, and I don't see a good explanation for that. Despite a large-scale search of the river, Jason's body wasn't found and has never been found since ultimately meaning that in the end, he'd vanished without a trace. What do you think happened here? Now, it's time to end this video and hand it over to you in the comments below. I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around on the screen. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell and subscribe if you haven't already, it helps me a lot. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike. I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys. Peace.